Uh, Sahika gave a very good introduction to printed electronics, and I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of that as well. Uh, my talk is more geared towards uh, high frequency or radio frequency electronics, but we will also talk a little bit about sensors. Um, uh, so let me start with the with the uh, kind of introduction, uh, which is which is like a motivation for 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 our our work. Uh, if you see the trends in electronics going uh, from like 70s onwards, you see that uh, the trends are very clear, right? They they are becoming electronics are becoming smaller in size and lighter in weight and lower in cost and also with enhanced functionality. So, you know, we see that we are, uh, we have smart watches, smartphones and all that. And I think next in line is are the wearable sensors, the internet of things domain uh, where we're entering. And that's where this uh, particular uh, uh, topic is, is, is of interest. Now, the, as I said in the beginning of this uh, master class, uh, that printed electronics is very suitable for large area uh, or large volume electronics, also for variable and flexible electronics. So there are many applications, like I'm, I'm gonna talk from the radio frequency perspective is uh, RFID, which is the radio frequency identification uh, system, which is used, you know, whenever you go uh, through uh, like a uh, parking or, or something when you have automat automated gates and stuff like that, uh, the RFID technology is being used. This is very suitable application, billion dollar, billions of dollar market and, and uh, printed electronics is kind of uh, very suitable for this. And I think some of them are adapting this. Other uh, emerging applications is Internet of Things. You know, I think many of you are familiar with this, but briefly Internet of Things is, uh, is the, uh, where uh, billions of non-living things Will will make smart decisions for humans to make your day to day life easier, um, and and these uh, two important things for uh, from our perspective are the sensors and the communication, which means a car or a house, uh, any non living thing it has to make a decisions for humans. Then it should have some kind of sensing, like we humans have eyes and ears and nose to smell or to taste, you know, or see, and then we communicate, you know, for example, fire, if we see fire, we see it or we feel the heat and then we communicate to the people through an alarm or by speaking out loud that there's a fire, right? So these kind of things they need to do. So wireless sensing and communication uh, aspect of it is very important from IoT application. That's where we focus on as well. So these are kind of known applications, but printed electronics is not only in, in, in research, by the way, it is uh, being adapted by the industry. You could see TemTrack is a company which comes up with this Bluetooth-based sensor, which is flexible and variable. Uh, so children, you know, who have fever and all that, the sticker could just go on them and through the Bluetooth link, uh, the, the temperature of the sick child can go to the parent's phone. Very convenient. Imagine if there's a rigid printed circuit board, you know, it cannot go into a child body. So new applications are emerging. This is the uh, HVAC, like the heat and the ventilation is AC control of a Mitsubishi wagon, actually from quite some years ago, which is all printed. It's already in use in the cars. Uh, there's another company, Bebop, which do, does these printed sensors in the insoles to monitor your activities. And this is a Norwegian company, which has these near field communication NFC stickers, which tell you if the bottle has been opened before or, or not. So all these uh, kind of products are in business right now. So this means that industry is adapting the concept of uh, printed electronics, which is very interesting. Now, also 3D printing uh, is part of additive manufacturing, uh, though I'm not going to talk a lot about it, uh, but it is being considered as the uh, next industrial revolution. Uh, look at this prosthetic arm, which has been just made out for $50. Uh, previously, it was uh, uh, hundreds or, or at least uh, thousands of dollars. Uh, and this has been 3D printed. You know, um, concepts like this. I like this example where uh, this is in the International Space Center and they needed this uh, tool up there. They had a 3D printer. The design file was sent to them and they printed the tool right there uh, in the National Space Center. So that's the, the value of printing, you know, rapid prototyping, making making it on spot in a fast, uh, fast fashion. Uh, anything and everything which this model is wearing, uh, ranging from the dress to the, to the purse to the glass, everything has been 3D printed. So imagine now 3D printing is uh, taking over all these uh, aspects of life. Uh, shoes are being printed, uh, you know, and electronics is not far behind. So, so additive manufacturing is changing, changing the world. Now, I know Sahika gave a good, very good introduction on the on the printing i'm going to just talk a little bit more about it so traditionally what we call a subtractive manufacturing whether uh, you have a printed circuit board 
if you are trying to do a circuit or whether you go to the clean room what you need is is basically you need a mask to create your layout so printed circuit board you have metals on both sides and if you need to create your pattern you basically etch material you remove material to create your pattern with the help of a mask or some screen right similarly if you go to the clean room you need to have like these expensive masks and you deposit the material and then you remove etch to create your patterns this is what we call a subtractive manufacturing which means that you are removing the deposited material and so material wastage is there right and expensive masks are required printing on the other hand can be as simple as you print in the home and office environment right so if you have the right ink right you could just get it to the printer and you could digitally create your pattern on the host substrate the way you want you don't need expensive masks or screens you don't need to etch you don't need to remove material you only deposit or add material where it is required that's why it's called additive manufacturing that is why it is low cost because it can uh, save a lot of material cost it can save the cost of uh, cost of uh, mask and other all all is done in digital fashion now this is uh, promising because also you know how newspapers and magazines have been, been printed. we know printing on newspaper and magazines from 100 years right and we know printing on textiles like like these cotton t-shirts which you wear and you have all these uh, writings on them these are screen printed you know and we know this printing from maybe 40 years or so but bringing this to electronics you know is a different ball game and uh, thanks to these nanoparticles or nano wire based inks new inks which have improved the conductivities and the performances that you know uh, printed electronics is becoming a rea reality now aim of people like me or you know uh, my other you know uh, speakers here uh, is that we want to print electronics like newspapers and magazines roll to roll reel to reel you know so imagine if you have a millimeter scale or micrometer scale device and you have a printer which is going uh, so printing with a speed of 40 meters per second takes a 1 meter by 1 1 uh, meter by 1 meter sheet how many devices you will print in one second that's the kind of throughput we are talking about we are not there yet but all of us are striving in the research domain to achieve uh, this kind of goal so to have electronics printed like this and uh, we have done some work in this domain which we will share and and and, and there's a lot of other challenges which are still remaining before going in um, uh, to the details of our work i'm just going to show a couple of or maybe few slides tutorial again sahika has done a good job on showing that i'm going to you know kind of add on that uh we talk about the, these nanoparticle based inks in my group we also try to make some inks and we start with basically let's say i'm talking about metallic inks here so we start with metal salts and we put some reducing agents basically to convert these salts into like uh, metal nuclei and we also put some kind of capping agents the capping agents keep in mind uh, uh, this is used for two purposes one is to control the size of the nanoparticles uh, or nano wires Uh, also it is used so that before printing these nano particles or nano wires they don't mix with each other and form big lumps so then they cannot be printed so so keep this in mind i will show you this and then once you mix this and you start heating it and and process it you will see the small metal nuclei will uh, will start to appear after time and then you see that these metal nuclei in the cartoon have red boundaries which will probably become more prominent here these red boundaries are the capping agents or the polymer coatings or we also call it call them as ligands right so they are there so that these nanoparticles size could be controlled and they cannot mix with each other to form big lumps before we don't want want big lumps uh, before we print otherwise the nozzles of the printers will be jammed then basically you put this in the right solvent you mix it and then you will have Uh, with the right, right viscosity and right surface tension you will have your ink in this particular case a silver nanoparticles based metallic ink which is uh, which can be used now uh, typically we there, there are different kind of printers but uh, we generally use a piezo kind of printer so i'm just going to show quickly uh, uh, how it works basically we have a piezo material we apply a, a electric field across it you know piezo materials change their shapes Uh, uh when when uh, electric field is applied to them or a voltage is applied to them so when this is a uh, piezo element is placed on a vibration plate so then basically it can go on top of a nozzle uh, or a chamber with a nozzle and when you apply voltage electric fields these drops would come out and then you have a lot of nozzles uh, which will be next to each other and then you could print at simultaneously traces on the host substrate 
uh, and then you could have a continuous trace. That's how a typical piezo printer works. Now, by virtue of applying electric field, this means that you have very precise control on the drop which will be uh, jetted out of that nozzle. So that actually gives us the flexibility of controlling the size of the drops and, and the feature sizes. Now, one thing which is important to uh, tell is that remember the, the capping agent uh, or the, the, the ligand which we have so that the nanoparticles will not mix with each other. This is still there even if you have printed. Now, this means that you have insulating barriers. So this cannot form conductive traces. So, so we need to get rid of them. Also, we need to get rid of the solvent, right? So if you want to make like solid uh, uh, transmission lines, solid connections, you need to make met metallic lines. You need to get rid of them. So what you do, this process is called sintering. And this sintering can be a number of ways. The most simple is heating. You know, you can heat it in an oven. So the solvent will evaporate and eventually these, uh, these ligands or uh, polymer coatings will go away and the nanoparticles will start to mix with each other. And then eventually you will start to form the conductive patterns. And then more number of layers you print, the better conductivity you can get. I'm going to talk more about it. And uh, eventually you will have integrated, I'm not going to play this video. You have integrated heating sintering mechanisms to, to basically convert the wet ink on the substrate to some uh, like conductive patterns. So that's kind of uh, the process of uh, going from um, uh, metal salts to, to printed patterns on, on a whole substrate. Now, when you talk about printing and, you know, I mentioned about uh, printing like newspapers and magazines, paper comes to your mind, right? Said, so, oh, printing is related to paper because that's what we've been doing all our lives, right? Uh, electronics is not known to be realized on paper, but this is changing. You know, people are now realizing electronics on paper like solar cells, RFIDs, etc. are being realized on, on, on papers. Paper is the cheapest substrate. I think this is one tenth of the price of the cheapest plastic bottle which you drink water in and you throw it away. So if we can utilize paper, we can really uh, come up with very low cost electronics and also we can do roll to roll. And this is more importantly environmentally friendly because papers are biodegradable, right? Because they come from a renewable source from trees. So they can de de biodegradably, they can go into the, the environment. They do not damage like plastic. So it's a good source. So when we started work in this area, uh, many years ago, uh, we also started to work on, on paper substrates and you started working with a silver nanoparticle based ink and we were using a Dymatix Fujifilm uh, tabletop uh, uh, printer uh, and we were new to this field. So, so uh, we, we started characterizing it. How many layers can we print? How what's the resolution? How, what kind of conductivity for these high frequency electronics? Conductivity is very important. The higher the conductivity, the better is the performance. So uh, what we saw is that when you print more layers on top of you, so you print one layer, then you print another layer on top of it, then you print another, the more over, uh, layers you print on top of each other, the better conductivity you get. The more heating you do, more sintering you do, the better conductivity you get. The conductivity is shown here, like one into 10 per seven uh, Simmons per meter. This is very, very good because if you look at the bulk metals like uh, silver or co copper, for example, they are five into 10 per seven Simmons per meter. So this is getting, this is not bulk metal. This is just printed layers with nanoparticles. So this is coming close to the conductivities of, of those. The reason for having better conductivity for uh, more layers is because uh, you have a certain amount of nanoparticles in the solvent. So when you print one layer, there is some nanoparticles which are there. Then when you print another layer, the more nanoparticles come in and they fill, fill in the like gaps. Then you print more nanoparticles, you fill in the gaps. Eventually, these gaps are filled and you have continuous traces and you get better conductivity. Also, you could control the thickness of the trace you require. Uh, want to mention that for uh, high frequency electronics, the thickness of the conductor is important because that can incur losses. Uh, something called skin damp. Now, with the standard dynamics printer, and I know somebody asked Sahika this question. I'll try to answer that question about the feature size and the conductivity. Uh, the with the tabletop printer, we can get like twenty microns kind of feature sizes, gaps or widths and all that. And each layer which we printed give us point half a micron. So let's say if I want to get three micron of conductor thickness, I will print six layers. And you could print 20 layers, whatever thickness you want, you could print, of course, it will take more time and more ink. So depending on your application, you should decide that. But one, one uh, uh, layer was giving that kind of thickness. And the conductivity, as I've shown you, has, it gives you like around uh, 1.2 which is pretty good for a nanoparticle-based lab. Now we have 
somebody asked like uh, can we enhance the feature sizes which we are doing with with this and yes of course there are new printers this is a very hot field printed electronics is a very hot field every year there are new printers and new printing techniques are coming out we have recently acquired a printer a super inkjet printer which can actually go down to go down to 1 micron and it can work with a lot of uh, uh, variety of inks like the viscosity is not a limit it can go to very low viscosity to up to 10000 so very viscous to very uh, low uh, low low viscosity it can print um, there are other printers who are now coming up which can go below 1 micron so you we are getting into the regime of hundreds of nanometers so i am pretty sure in coming years we will have printing printers and printing methods which will go to nanometers of course if you look at cmos the standard way of doing electronics lithography was the same 30 years ago we 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 would have hundreds of microns now we can do nanometers right so it's a process and i think printing electronics is very uh, fast in catching up now when we started doing printing you know and i was learning from the people who were doing before me and i had a friend in georgia tech uh, who was doing this so they were using big ovens so when they they print they put their whole substrate in the oven and we were printing on paper we were printing on plastics and we did the same you know we were following them so we put our uh, samples in the oven some of the our papers were burnt like completely brown or black some of our plastic was molded and i was like what the hell is happening you know and why we cannot solve this problem i realized that we we only want to heat the metal trace i don't want to heat the substrate why should i heat the substrate and when i put it in an oven i heat everything so so with this thought you know we thought about uh, you know trying lasers so we had a laser you know 10.6 micron and we we cranked it up with full power and then we 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 you know uh, focused it on our metallic trace and we tried to heat it with the full power and you know what it worked like a charm it worked like a charm because what we could do in an oven uh, after 2 hours and with the with the chance of damaging your substrate uh, we were able to reduce this to 5 or 10 minutes and we were able to uh, get the same kind of performance conductivity as all that with laser centering without damaging the substrate so it worked very well and we did a lot of work with that and later on you know i'm going to talk we 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 went to other ways of centering as well and we realized that oven is may not be the best way of centering okay now this kind of introduction on printing and centering and all that i'm going to show you some applications some designs we do different kind of works like radio frequency antennas sensors and i'm going to all show you all of that and go quickly uh, to so that i'm within the time frame uh, my group does a lot of uh, uh, radio frequency front end which means the antennas and the circuits radio to the this is one design we are be showing a very wide band uh, antenna design which means an antenna which can cover frequency ranges from 3 to 10 gigahertz so this means it can have a very high data rate high data rate so uh, and also interesting thing about this design is that we have this kind of fractal approach in here so not only we enhance the performance but we also save ink here so in this design if you have a solid piece uh, versus this design we will save 60% of the ink and we printed this on on a on a paper substrate you see the front and back it it's print it like like maybe tens of minutes and it's flexible it's disposable you could use it it's very low cost you could use it throw it print a new one right and the performance is as good as the standard printed circuit board rigid antennas which are more expensive which take more time to to manufacture the performance is uh, is very good as, as we show in this work that the performance is similar similarly we showed that you could have multiple multiple band antennas like uh, by creating these interesting slots you could make one antenna to work no you you look at your phones now you have gsm talking a voice you have uh, messaging you have wifi you have bluetooth you have gps for google maps you you have a lot all of these need antennas right so what we showed is that you could have one antenna cover all these bands and again we printed it front and back sides uh, on on a paper substrate and it worked on different bands very well as a printed circuit board antenna would work and and then we also while we were centering this photo uh, the the, the antennas which we printed on the photo papers so this is a photo paper we realized that when we try to center it in let's say different shapes let's say on this kind of uh, small metallic cylinder uh, after heating it would become kind of rigid in that shape it would not come back to its original shape so it loses its flexibility and we were not sure in the beginning then later on we realized that this particular photo paper had some kind of polymer coating in it which becomes rigid right so which is also good because if you want 
cur- curved surfaces you want to put antennas or on some poles or human arm or something this is fine but if you want to maintain flexibility we got papers which were without uh, the polymer coating and they stay uh, they stay flexible you know you want to use them uh, flex it the way you want and they were working fine we also printed one of my student you know was very enthusiastic on using different sizes he printed started printing on leather and and t-shirts and all that so we had a f- full shoe radar this is on plastic uh, different designs and we also printed a full system on uh, on a normal cotton t-shirt i'm going to talk more about it so so this is the beauty of this this method you cannot have uh, like uh, with conventional methods electronics to be printed on these kind of host substrates where you you are printing electronics on let's on, on a t-shirt i'm going to give you a system level example um, a funny story one of my friend had a 2 year old son uh, got lost in one of the malls in jadda for 30 minutes they lost their toddler you know in, uh, and then 30 minutes later they found the son in in one of the uh, uh, shops playing under a table or something right and he was telling me the story on the weekend and i said with all this technology you should have you should be able to find your son right and he said how and he said mm, let me put a master student on it you know so anyways this started like a like a fun project and uh, but eventually it, it 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 became a little bit bigger so to find missing children to find uh, toddlers we designed a system uh, which basically works both outdoors and indoors outdoors it is standard you know works with a gps system and it finds the location it sends through how you send messages right how do you send message sms messages or uh, it sends the coordinates uh, through uh, through the, through that medium to our server and this server will demonstrate the position of the person or of the child or can be a pet on uh, any internet enabled device right indoor gps does not work that was a challenge so we started working with wifi so or most of the indoor buildings and all that have wifi so indoor we track with wifi we send the data through wifi we show it on our server and then we display it on a on a device this just shows our testing in cows this is just showing the top view the red one is a commercial gps based lo- localization or or tracking system whereas green one is our cows developed patented technology where whether we are outside whether we go inside the building you see we go inside the building we still tracking so as soon as our system goes inside person goes inside the system switches from gps to wifi so that's uh, something which we developed eventually we we saw there is commercial interest actually we developed this with printing and this is the first time we did the printed circuit board as well you see very complex on uh, through printing on the paper substrate we have uh, we have a sim we have batteries we have three antennas and we packaged all this like a variable tag and this was working well we created uh like a full server system so you could log in and let's say i was here i'm tracking my students two of my students here you know later on my students uh, actually you know it's funny they they put a a tag while in my car and they were tracking me for months and i did not know so they exactly know when which time the professor is coming to the lab and which time he's going out so so i found out when they told me one day that oh you were speeding in jadda uh, late night and i said how do you know and then i found out they put a tag in my car anyways uh, so this this uh, technology worked well you could actually have like till 4 to 5 meters you could uh, uh, track like this is a good uh, this is a good uh, kind of uh, resolution uh, for finding out now this became big and i'm not showing you here but my students uh, bilal here uh, they started a company based on this now we have a variable in terms of uh, uh, of uh, like a bracelet and uh, this is now for 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 uh, toddlers uh, uh, tracking this is now a product uh, company uh, is called albasser tracking uh so which is uh, now commercializing this technology but i went on ahead and and in research and i thought to myself we are printing this on a paper substrate how about printing it directly on the child's t-shirt right so we started printing on a textile right and this is just showing the the textile which is uh, a normal cotton textile and when we started printing on it the ink would go through the holes right so we were not able to print successfully the metal metallic ink on it so what we did was that we actually uh, printed uh, a dielectric layer so we have a dielectric pvp ink and then we printed it and then uh, make printing a thick layer of uh, the dielectric and then we printed metal metallic traces on it and then it was still flexible and all that and uh, i'm going to skip you the details of printing but uh, we were able to print a full wifi tracking system on the t-shirt and this one does not use gps and all that this is just wifi because we wanted to make it less complex and uh, uh, this is my student who is wearing this shirt and going around and we were able to track it because this is using wifi 
uh, only not uh, GSM, GPS or any other technology. So the resolution is up to 15 meters. So, which is fine. I think the application is if a child is lost and the parents can get to the child within the vicinity, vicinity of 10 to 15 meters, I think they will eventually find the child. So, which is fine. Uh, people are, are often ask me this question, oh, you, how are you doing with Wi-Fi? Do you... So we connect to the routers. They, basically, if you're walking in cows, there are a lot of Wi-Fi routers. So we connect to them. And, and uh, some people ask me, do you know, need to know the passwords of those? So the answer is no, we don't need to know the password. We just go at a very top layer. We just know the, connect to them and know their location. And that's how we found, find it out. Uh, I was presenting this work in one of the conferences and one guy asked me, oh, this is very nice. Uh, you guys are uh, printing on t-shirts. Can you wash them? Uh, and I said, very good question. I don't know. Let me go back and <laughs> try to work on it. So we started working on something uh, washable. So then we created a process on where we would have a protective layer. And also we now started working with stretchable inks. So if in the inks, conductive inks, if you can include the right polymers, uh, you could make them stretchable as well. And human bo uh, body or like the textiles which we wear are up to 30% stretchability. So that was kind of our goal. So two goals, we make it stretchable and also we make it uh, resistant to washing. So this is a normal kind of a athletic t-shirt, which is stretchable and we printed a uh, kind of a filter there with our stretchable ink. Actually, we printed with both things, non-stretchable and stretchable. And you see this one is we are stretching it, the other one we are not stretching it. And the one which which is non-stretchable, you see it immediately develops cracks and does not work because uh, it, you, you will have uh, uh, cracks in your, it's non-stretchable. The one which has uh, polymers mixed with it, it's it, when you stretch it to like 30%, it does develop some cracks, but as soon as you release it, the cracks are filled again. So, so it actually can work, can rework and we did many cycles, hundreds of cycles and it worked and you could see that the performance up to 30% or 25% of cycles was okay as well as the non-stretchable could not work much. And then you know, we wash it. This is a, not a washing machine. This is a small, small tool in my lab. So we used it as a washing machine and, and, and we washed, uh, wash it many times. And then eventually the protective layer protected. So the answer is yes, you could wash it multiple times and you could still wear your t-shirt and wash it. And then you can have your electronics on it. Right. So that was, that was pretty interesting. Now, uh, uh, how much time do I have? I have 15, 20 minutes, right? Abdulina? Because I do want to show some sensor work. Now, in electronics, sometimes you need to have uh, connections between multiple layers, which means that you need to have holes which are metallic, right? So we, we call it in that term, uh, language of electronics called vias. Vias are conductive holes which connect one layer to the other. And so in one of the designs, we needed this uh, these holes. And we so what we did, we drilled a, drilled a hole like through lasers. And then we tried to fill it with printing ink and, and it did not work because first of all, it's very thick, one mm. And you remember one layer was printing was giving us half a micron. So this means I need a thousand layers of printing, not practical. Also, it was not sticking to the vertical wall. So what we did, we actually uh, created this staircase with the help of laser on both sides of the substrate. And then we printed on it. So with the help of five layers of inks, we were able to make these kind of uh, interconnecting vias, metallic vias um, in a very thick 1 mm substrate. And these vias work very well. These are showing you the, some of the images of these vias. And then, of course, we did a lot of designs based on in uh, these substrate integrated vias. This is showing a, a, a trans, trans, transition from a standard transmission line to a waveguide. And you see all these vias on the corners. They work very well. And we did a lot of design in this kind of... So realizing thick vias uh, or, or on multiple multiple uh, substrates connecting multiple layers. Now, remember, I'm talking about fully printing. Fully printing means that I not only print conductor layers, but I also print the dielectric layers or the substrates. We also want to print the substrates. So we started doing this work uh, with the organic substrates first. This work is showing we are doing PVP, a kind of organic layer. So we print one layer of PVP, then we print the metallic layer, then we have some dielectric layers, then we have some metallic layers. And here we do some interesting kind of vias, which means that uh, we print these uh, met, uh, dielectric layers and we want to connect this bottom layer to the top layer. We do not heat these dielectric layers and we, when they are wet, we, we print metal. So the metallic ink, is because the dielectric is wet, it, it, it dissolves through, it seeps through and reaches the other side. As soon as it reaches the other side, we basically heat it and solidifies and, and no further seepage or diffusion is possible. So we call this dissolving type of vias. And so we were able to connect these layers. And so we were able to connect, create this multi-layer process, which is fully printed. 
So we have print the dielectric, we print multilayers, and we have, and we showed many examples of inductors, capacitors, and filters in this process. So we show fully printed inductors, capacitors, all those uh, with these within this process. Now, you know, long story short, we have come a long way uh, from going from uh, oven sintering and burning our substrates. <laughs> you know, we can now do uh, 3D printing. We we actually hacked 3D printers and we put 2D inks in there and we put the 3D inks into the 2D printers and we've created a multi-layer process where we combine 3D printing, inkjet printing, screen printing. We do a number of different kinds of sintering ranging from UV to infrared, flash sintering. I will show you an example of uh, uh, flashlight sintering later on as well. And we showed for the first time, uh, I think back a few years ago, uh, the, the fully printed 3D and, and, and inkjet printing combination uh, through this curing and we showed this very high performing gigahertz electronics uh, in these processes uh, uh, there. So as I said, the, the, this field is progressing very fast and you know people are now showing a lot of other stuff uh, which multi-layer uh, electronics are now feasible. Also, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. We, my group has done a lot of work on 3D printing, uh, uh, antennas, filters, others. This is just showing the honeycomb structure. Typically, if you want to make this kind of structure in a workshop, it will take you probably hours and hours in a day. And we print it very fast, very complex concentric circles and very high performing. These kind of uh, designs we have done through 3D printing. We have combined 3D printing with metallic inkjet and screen printing. Uh, we have printed lenses and stuff like that. So there's a whole body of work on 3D printing. Now, I'm not a material scientist, and my, uh, but you know, when I came into this field of printed electronics, I really realized that there's not a lot of inks commercially available. So really the game is if you can make your own ink. So we started working on it and slowly and steadily we learned and we made a lot of metallic inks and stuff like that. I'm not going to talk about uh, the metallic inks, a lot of metallic inks we did. I'm just going to talk about some specialized inks. For example, we did a magnetic ink. So we, this is iron oxide. And we can print completely magnetic substrates. This is the first time anybody has printed uh, kind of magnets. And uh, based on that, then we can print electronics on these magnetic substrates. What is the advantage? You could bring magnets close to these substrates, printed substrates, and you could change the property of this substrate. So any structure you realize on it, you control the properties of that. You could change the frequency. You could change the pattern. So these are reconfigurable electronic components, which we realize on mag magnetically controlled. So we printed the full substrates. We printed, of course, we know antennas very well. And you could see here that just by changing the magnetic bias, we can change the, the we can change the frequency of operation. We can change their patterns and all of that, uh, these things uh, through microwave control. So there's a whole, again, body of work on these magnetically controlled, fully printed electronics. Also, we uh, kind of printed the uh, world's first switch at gigahertz RF frequencies. If you want to go and buy switches uh, at high frequencies, let's say tens of gigahertz, they are very expensive. So we tried to buy, buy some from analog devices. This was one switch was around $30. So if you want to use multiple switches, right, you, this will cost you a fortune. Also, these switches are very small. So if you want to attach to your structures for switching purposes, you need to do very minute soldering. So I wanted to get rid of both these issues. So we created an ink based on vanadium dioxide, which is a phase change material. It is insulator at room temperature. It becomes a conductor uh, when you heat it or pass current. We did both. We did thermal switching. We did electrical switching and we made an ink. It took us one year to make this ink and then we print it. So you see this black one is the, the vanadium dioxide switch, the black one here. So when you heat it or when you pass current through it, it either becomes an insulator, it becomes a conductor. So you could use it as switch. You do not need any soldering. And this cost like costs like one cent because just a drop of ink. So wherever you need a switch, you drop an ink, no soldering, no attachment method required. And here goes your switch. It works up to 40 gigahertz or we've not tested beyond that. Probably it would work there as well. So works as a decent switch, decent switch. And we were very, very happy about this result. And we showed then many reconfigurable uh, components, for example, this antenna here, you see the printed switch here. This is a printed antenna. When we heat it, it works at a different frequency. When we, when it, at room temperature, it works at a different frequency, it pattern changes. So again, we have control. You could print switches that way. More recently, we have done uh, our metallic ink, which is optically transparent. So it's based on silver nanowires. And what is the application? There's a lot of now 
uh, interest in uh, in having uh, transparent electronics on the windows of the buildings for 5G, 6G, on the windows of the cars and all that uh, to control electromagnetics. Also, you know, let's say if you want to print uh, antennas on solar cells. So uh, silver nanowires actually have uh, the cap uh, the capability of being uh, optically transparent and uh, but the major issue is if you try to increase the optical transparency their uh, the, their conductivity decreases we worked on this problem and uh, through special flashlight centering process which we call welding we kind of welded these nano wires and we increased the conductivity without affecting their uh, transparency so that that was something which was uh, very good, and we kind of achieved a uh, world record on on the uh, figure of merit for this, uh, like optical transparency and conductivity. And we we designed this uh, frequency selective surfaces. Uh, these basically can uh, control the electromagnetic sing signals in the air. So what is going through this, it can either block it or it can allow it to go. Very important for five G and six G communications. How you control the electromagnetic signals, and you could see it is pretty transparent. It is almost 80% transparent, and but it, it blocks uh, the signals at two frequencies. Uh, you could see it is flexible, it is rollable, very nice optically transparent electronics. And then again, we are uh, doing work on this for the, for the 6G applications. Okay, just one example on energy harvesting, how you can harvest energy from thin air, like the wireless signals all around us. We have designed this fully printed cube which works on different frequencies. So it, it and then we have designed, uh, so this, see this, this is how we assemble it. This is a 3D printed antenna system and we have designed the electronics. This antenna receives the wireless signals all around us, like 900 megs, uh, 1800 megahertz to 3G, like GSM and 3G frequencies, and then converts into DC. So, you know, wireless signals are all around us. We, our mobile phones work on this, right? So we thought these are all around us. Can we also harvest some energy from them, right? So we were able to uh, collect them and we were able to convert into useful electricity. You see that we were we were getting decent, like uh, millivolts. Uh, we can capture millivolts from this. And funny thing is, if some people is talk, talk, talking to you on mobile phones around you, you collect more more power. The more mobile phone activity, the more power you collect. And we saw this that in the peak hours, and we actually know in cows when the mobile phone things, uh, data and everything is going up because we were collecting more energy, right? And it was consistent with the data we got from the telecom. And uh, up to 500 millivolts we could get, which is good enough to power the sensor nodes and all that like uh, small uh, uh, sensor applications. Now, just before going, I know I'm almost out of time. I probably have five, seven minutes left. I just want to show uh, some sensing systems uh, on printing. I know uh, Saika showed you some biosensors. I'm going to show you some other sensors. This is a sensor which we did for um, uh, Aramco uh, oil industry. Their problem was that when they tried to get oil from the wells, there's water mixed with it. And they did not have any real-time system to find out how much water is mixed. So for them, going into a well, uh, uh, spend millions of dollars and eventually found out that's 50% water and 50% oil, it's not worth it. So they need to know real time, right? right? So they came to us and, 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 and we said that, okay, we can probably do a real time system where we can tell you how much percentage of water is going. The concept is very simple. On the pipe surface, we created a resonant structure uh, uh, in high frequency language. This is a structure where the electric and magnetic energy becomes equal and it has a resonant frequency. And we have a ground plane so that there's electric fields which go from the top to the bottom inside you have mixture is going which is the oil and water mixture is going we did not want to interrupt the mixture we, we cannot interrupt the flow of the mixture because there are hundreds of kilometers of uh, pipelines and, and and in the wells there are pipelines so we cannot be intrusive so but our electric fields just go through in a non-intrusive way and we can this sensor will have a resonant frequency and luckily the oil and water have very different properties so when the water quantity starts to increase our resonant frequency starts to move. So see, we can actually find out even 1% of water mixed with oil without even physically touching that mixture. You know, so it was very interesting. We did a basic prototype and it worked very well. And, and we, we went back to Ramco said, we've solved your problem. Here it is, go test it. They took it to, they were very happy. They took it to Houston. They have an industrial flow loop. Before putting it into the field, they wanted to test into a lab setup. They tested it. And they came back to us, they said, well, Professor Atif, your sensor works very well sometimes. 
and it does not work at other times. And I said, what are you talking about? You know, it works well all the time. And he says, no, when we put it in this fashion, where this top conductor is on the top, it works fine. But when we move it or, or in a different fashion, it does not work. And I says, oh, wait, you cannot do this. You, the top conductor has to be on the top, right? And they said, no, we cannot do this because we have so many long pipes. We cannot be worrying about the orientation. So this is not a good design. And because I had taken money from them, so I had to go back and rethink the design. So, so we went back and we thought about a spiral kind of a shape of the designs, which where the conductor goes around it. So whatever is the orientation of the, uh, the, the, the pipe, this will still be uh, give you the right reading. And this is again, screen printed on the pipe surface. And, and now this work where this is like the picture from Houston where they're checking uh, this, uh, and you know, it worked very well. Whatever is the orientation, uh, whatever is the orientation the pipe worked very well. And uh, this now also resulted into a startup company called Sahir Flow. These sensors are now installed in Aramco fields. We are very happy about it. Uh, and my student graduated Akram, Mohammed Akram Karimi, he is now running that company and, and looking after these, uh, these sensors. So something good which came out of the lab. I'm going to show you another for IoT. This is the second last example I want to show you of environmental monitoring. Now, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, Saudi Green Initiative or Saudi Climate Initiative, right? So monitoring. And we realize that Saudi Arabia, it, more than 80% of Saudi Arabia is not monitored for uh, gases, toxic gases or air pollutants. And uh, so the first step is to find out how's the environment around you. And we cannot do extensively cover this area because our uh, sensors are very expensive. The infrastructure, if you want to cover the entire Saudi Arabia, if you want to cover the entire world. So our idea is have very small, light, disposable sensors, drop them from a drone, and they, they, they become your noses and ears or whatever they sense, and they wirelessly send data to your server, and you monitor those areas. These are disposable. So after a few months, you have another flight of drones, drop some more, no problem. They are low cost. So for example, in this particular case, we designed a sensor system where inks, again, you know, we have specialized inks, carbon nanotube based inks, P.PSS based inks, uh, and other inks. So which are sensitive, let's say CNTs for gases, for example, hydro uh, H2S gas or other gases. Um, uh, for temperature sensing, for humidity sensing, we have all of this combined 3D and inkjet printed. Even the PCB is inkjet printed, very low cost, the whole sensor system, we can easily find out how what's the temperature, humidity, gas levels, and it gives an early early alarm. If a certain area is a certain amount of gas or pollutant is increasing, it sends you uh, 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 alert that okay, there is some some problem in this particular region, right? Last example which I want to show you is for biomedical application. Something you know what uh, uh, Saika has been talking about. This is a smart bandage system for uh, chronic wound patients. Chronic wound patients are those patients like diabetic patients, uh, obese patients whose wounds don't heal in time, and they have to get admitted to hospital environments or they get uh, they they they. Doctors need to monitor their wounds for a long time. So what we did, we took a, a, a conventional, regular uh, uh, bandage, and we created inks to monitor the to do the sensing. For example, uh, uh, the bleeding patterns. How much is the bleeding happening on the wound, and how much is the pressure exerted on the wound, and and uh, uh, if the wound has developing some infection. You know, so all this at the comfort of your home and office environment, you do not need to go anywhere. You just wear this. And so these are the sensors. And then there's a Bluetooth electronic sticker on top of it, which basically sends all the sensor data to your phone and which is sent to the doctor. So you're wearing this bandage, which is, by the way, still disposable. You can take this bandage, throw it, and you could put this Bluetooth sticker to the next bandage. And, and, and all your information is going to your doctor. And I'm going to skip you the details of the sensing because of lack of time, but we can monitor whether it is bleeding or, uh, or sweat, uh, how much bleeding, bleeding patterns, we can see how much pressure is exerted because most of these patients, when they go through surgery or let's say they have a foot ulcer, they put pressure on their wounds. So that becomes the way and, and also infection through pH sensing. And this can send up to, you know, 80, uh, up to 70 or 80 meters, uh, this uh, wireless uh, data wirelessly. So to the convenience of your uh, home and office. So these kind of examples for internet of things, sensing and communication, uh, I'm going to stop here. Again, I would like to thank my group. This is all the work of my, my students, researchers. 
uh, and uh, thanks to them. And I'm open for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Atif. Uh, so I'd like now to open the floor if you have any questions. Uh, please write them down. Um, so now we'll start with the first uh, person, uh, Kastim. I'll try to uh, unmute you. And hopefully this time it works. Um, see, can you talk or do you want me to read your question? All right, I'll just go ahead and read it. Um, so she says, could you uh, please comment on the robustness of the paper-based antennas? Yeah, so that, that's an interesting question because, you know, as I said in the beginning, paper electronics is not that common, right? So it is being investigated now. But remember, every electronics has a packaging layer. So, so what I did not show is that you could now do very thin coatings on these, which would not affect, uh, and I'm not showing you in this, this talk, but if you're more interested, I can send you some papers where we do very thin protective coating. Right. And remember, these are very low cost. The whole idea about these is they should not, we should not worry about lasting them for years. Right. You should print these antennas, use them, crumble them, throw them in a dustbin, print 10 new more. Right. Uh, but if you want it to be used in a product for a little bit longer time, you will have, you can have protective coatings and they, they can last for longer, longer, longer shelf life. I hope I answered. Uh, just uh, I have uh, one question for myself. Um, so this is kind of a general question regarding uh, interprinting. So you said before in the, your goal is to go to very fast roll-to-roll -roll printing. So how do you go from like lab setting interprinting all the way to roll? And what are the biggest challenges you face when you go to that scale? Actually, uh, there are numerous challenges. Numerous challenges, I think, uh, and, and you know, we are working with, uh, I, I don't have like this roll-to-roll -roll facility, but we have a partner in Europe who has these roll to roll printers, right? So one of the, you, uh, the challenging range from like going from materials to printing recipes, uh, to uh, 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 centering mechanisms, to then mounting of the components and packaging. So at every level you have challenges and this is a very new field. So, but uh, it's picking up. So for materials, inks, for example, the ones which work with our lab kind of scale uh, printers, their viscosity, surface tensions, their properties are different. You need to optimize them with the roll-to-roll -roll printers. So there, there's some experiment. Same goes with the printing recipes. Again, sintering mechanism, I did not play a video, but now sintering mechanisms are being uh, integrated with the roll-to-roll -roll printer. So as you're printing, so you have some flash sintering or in IR sintering, which is happening as you are printing. So, so that was previously challenged because you take something and then you center it, then you bring it back. So the whole momentum or roll to roll is gone, right? So, so, and then mounting of the components, which means that an integrated pick and place machine, pick and place machine is, has to be integrated with, so that you have the mounting of the components. If this is only passive devices, that's fine. But if you need to integrate actives as well, then, then, then you have uh, the issue. So there are challenges at uh, every stage. And I, a good thing is there are people, uh, you know, who are trying to solve uh, these challenges at every stage. Uh, all right, so we have a comment here from Maimuna. She's saying that uh, this technique for for two D materials, um, and I'm just it's curious to what you think as well as like how how do you well do you think inkjet printers are compatible with two D materials in general? I I don't I don't see a problem. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we have printed carbon nanotube extensively uh, for sensing. And uh, we have also tried graphene, uh, but we've not done extensive work on graphene, but I know other groups who are doing extensive work on uh, graphene. I also know MOS2, people have made inks and they are doing it. So I don't see a problem between the 2D materials and uh, the, the, the printing techniques. I think they, are, they, are, they, they have compatibility. Again, when you make inks, you need to make sure that they are compatible with the, with the printers without losing the inherent properties of the, the 2D material. We have a question here from uh, Mohammed. Um, so he's asking about, uh, will this uh, lead to recyclable sensors? Uh, of course, of course. Uh, the whole, whole point is disposable, recyclable uh, uh, kind of thing. So like right now, I can give you example of uh, plastic bottles you recycle, right? So uh, the people are now making sensors on these plastic bottles. Right, so these, uh, if these uh, pl plastic bottles go 
and, and then recycle and reuse, these sensors can be reused as well. And you just need to design in the right fashion and package in the right fashion that they can be recycled. Most of the material systems we talk about uh, can go through these, these recycling processes. And there are some groups actually who are doing work on, on these kind of recycling, uh, recyclable sensors. Me personally, I'm a big fan of disposable sensors. You know, make them so low cost that you, know, you throw them and you don't worry about them. And they are biodegradable, by the way. So, so yeah, but there is work going on recyclable sensors. Um, we have one more question from Maimuna. Uh, do you like to uh, talk or? Uh, which is, yeah, yeah, sure, take questions. And I think the other yeah, guys, Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adif, for your speech. Uh, I want to ask the MOS to a branch group at CAUS. Uh, I'm not sure. My group is not, not, not printing MOS2. There are many people, like uh, Sahika mentioned, she's doing MOS2, and uh, there, uh, there is a, a professor who, who now left, but he still has his lab. Uh, was doing MOS2. There are many, I think Hussam al-Sharif also uh, experiencing. I don't know if they are printing MOS2 or not. Uh, Saika probably may, may be able to uh, better explain this, but I know international groups who are doing MOS2 printing. Okay, can I connect you via email to know more about them? Oh, sure, well, why not, why not? Actually send email to both me and Saika if you can, because Saika probably has more uh, knowledge on this. And uh, sure, you can, whatever, like, this is open for everybody. Anybody who has a question, feel free. If you cannot ask it right now, please send us, uh, send us to on, on the email and, and we will be more than happy uh, to answer that. Okay. Uh, Abdulillah, there, I Thank think you so much. You're yeah, the, the, the information for all the, uh, all the speakers is on the website. So you can reach that directly. And if you guys need anything, I'll, I'll, send, it, I'll send it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My email is, I think, also on the on the on the uh, uh, where the master class is advertised. And so my email mm -hmm. is there. My my email is also available on the web. You just uh, search my name; it's available. Uh, uh, there are there some questions on the chat as well, other than the Q and A. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so some people are asking a question on the chat, uh, but that was uh, there's one more question on the Q and A as well that we have not answered. So on the Q and A, there is Mishari. If you would like to meet yourself, yeah, yeah, I see. I see this uh, for sure. Why not? We have we have uh, tried different centering mechanisms on three D printing, multi layer three D. We have done multi layer three D printing, and we have done metallic printing with the three D printing. And and uh, one of the slides which where I showed, we did flash centering, we did uh, IR centering, we did uh, laser. So so yes, laser centering can be done uh, for multi layer three D printing as well. You just need to know the limits. Uh, you need to set the power levels. You need to know the right wavelengths, uh, for, uh, and you need to know the limits of your your material system. Okay. Any so so this question, I think. Um, yeah, I think so. Reach the, the end of the questions. Um, this technique uh, is great for homogeneous surface with minimum point effects for nanomaterial based devices, especially for we've already done this, right? Two D materials. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I actually have one question that is a kind of a side thing. How long usually does it take to make one of these sensors from start to beginning? Look, if the if the if the ink is ready, there there some time it, uh, is taken when you are preparing the ink, and some time is taken in uh, uh, maturing the recipe. So you know, if you are using screen printing or inkjet printing, you need to do trial and error for have like right surface and right thickness. And so. once you have established that. Then it does not take a long time depending on which. So if you're using inkjet printing, that inkjet printing is for small areas, right? So do, don't use it for, for large area printing uh, because inkjet printing has better resolution. So a small sensor can be inkjet printed. If you're going for large uh, uh, structures, then screen printing. Screen printing is very fast. Like you could probably print in seconds. You know, one, one pass, boom. You know, one pass, uh, I... I in one of our other presentation, I have some videos. I don't have it on this one, uh, but it's just one pass is just like five seconds, ten seconds. If you do two or three passes, it will probably take thirty seconds. That's it. Your 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 sensor is printed. That, that's again the beauty of it, right? That you do very fast prototyping. Yeah, and the, the immediacy of, of these sensors is also something that was always quite interesting. That you just design it, and right away you have your sensor. You can make it in. Uh, yeah, 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 quickly, yeah. quickly, quickly. Yeah. Of course, there is science. There is science on making the inks. 
there is science on on printing recipes everything right but once the process is established and you have designed the sensor then printing process is is very fast uh -huh. so all right so this seems like the all the questions uh, so thank you again everyone for attending the talk um thank you so much quite interesting to hear from both the the panelists and again we'll be having uh two more uh speakers tomorrow and after that we'll have a panel discussion with all the speakers so you can ask them even more questions uh then um and we we'll look forward to seeing you again uh tomorrow and good evening and we'll see you